Now, I can't imagine a better way to kick off our brand new season. Our special guest this week is Olivia Lomax. She is the owner and founder of Delta Groove Yoga right here in Memphis. Olivia, hi. Hello. We're so happy to be with you today here at Be The Light. Um, folks, uh, I want you to meet Olivia. Will you please like start by just telling us about yourself, tell us where you are and, and what your work is. All right, my name is Olivia Lomax. I'm here in Memphis, Tennessee, and this is my house. This is actually my yoga room. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, this appeared because all of a sudden I was no longer in my yoga studio. Um, I have a yoga studio here in Midtown in Memphis, right in Overton Square. It's called Delta Groove Yoga. And um, we've been around eight years. And I originally came from Boulder, Colorado, moved here to Memphis 22 years ago. And I was actually a financial planner, believe it or not. And I found that um, I needed yoga to turn off my brain. I, I had been doing yoga from high school days just for physical body. But when I was in the finance industry, um, I was under a lot of stress. I was in a new city. Memphis is a very different city than Boulder, Colorado. I was struggling a bit and I would go to yoga classes like late at night, actually, or really early in the morning. I'd either be in a class at like 5 a.m. on like actually back in the day, just to tell you how long ago this was, PBS had a 6 a.m. yoga series. Mm -hmm. I'd get up and do that. And then I'd go to these like gym yoga classes because Memphis didn't really have a studio back then. And I would go to these gym yoga classes like at 8 p.m. at night. But I would find that during those times, it was the only time where my brain finally just stopped being like a ticker symbol. That, that's the way I described it. It just wouldn't stop. I couldn't quite focus. I was really stressed. And in yoga, all of a sudden, I would just feel, I would feel light. You know, I would feel clear. I would feel more articulate. I'd feel just relaxed and, and happy. And so that was the beginning kind of of my yoga journey. I found myself in the finance industry, all of a sudden talking to my clients about yoga instead of their like retirement. And so one day, <laughs> one day I just said, you know what, I think I'm going to take a sabbatical. I'd actually just had my third child. And I was like, you know, I think I'm going to take a sabbatical and just spend some time just kind of, you know, taking care of my kids and taking care of myself. And um, that same year I signed up for a yoga teacher training. And that, that was the beginning of my journey. I tell people I'm, I'm still on a sabbatical. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you really speak immediately to something that I, for the longest time in my own in my own creative life, uh, struggled with, and that is that I, I always have lots of ideas. I kind of feel that similar thing. Like for me, like ideas are like my 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 ticker <laughs> running across here all the time, and I really thought that I had to either slow it down, pick one, or I, I don't know, just quiet that you know all that information. And what really kind of getting into the practice in the last year, because I got very, I, I, I like to think I got very serious about it in the last year. And what it has done is like, it's allowed me to find a way to keep all of those trains running at the same time so that I don't have to pick one. I don't have to, you know, put one over the other that I can actually keep all of this, all these creative ideas flowing at the same time. Um, the practice that I started with Olivia, I, I first started Kundalini at Delta Groove um, in the middle of last summer um, and immediately felt the benefits of it. Um, I, I went in as, as often as I could because I was experiencing immediate benefits from the practice. Um, before we get too far into this, can you give us a brief explanation of Kundalini and what it, what it is for you? I can, absolutely. So um, I love to be a student. I love to study. And uh, when I moved here, there was, there was no Kundalini. I actually discovered it in books. I discovered it on VHS tapes. That's how long ago it was. And uh, what I discovered was it was instant like you just described. I would do these practices and just like you said, all of a sudden, just something was just coursing through me. And I'll never forget, I did this practice really early in the morning one day before I went in, I had a long day of meetings. But as soon as I walked in, I was just like, I was shining and everyone in the office was like, what did you do? Is it, <laughs> did you get new clothes? Like what, what's happening? And I was like, no, I did Kundalini. And they were like, is that a new 
type of like pasta? Like what, what'd you have for <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, no, 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 no. And I couldn't explain it to them. And part of the practice of Kundalini is we use, we use mantra. We use a, a man means mind and tra means liberation is the way I like to describe it. So we use mantra and this one particular mantra that we used a lot um, when I first started is Sat Nam, just very simple. Like it just means truth, is my name or I call upon truth I call and you just repeat it over and over and it just puts you in a different loop of thought versus the like oh I'm so busy or oh I need to go to the grocery store oh monkey mind right and when you get into that train of just like sat inhale nam exhale just like very simple simple and there's other ones that you can use I even tell my students you can use English you know like I am happy whatever whatever is just a repetitive mantra but it was the first time I'd done that and so that particular day was kind of one of those moments where I was like this is really working okay so what is kundalini right so kundalini in its essence is the primordial energy that lies and is within all of us you know i kind of play with the idea maybe maybe it is the dark matter who knows it's the dust i'm i'm watching the you know the golden compass as dark materials on Ooh, yeah. my HBO yeah. right now so kind of playing with that idea you know um but it's within all of us and some people say in the kundalini tradition you know it lies dormant it doesn't lie dormant it's never dormant it's primordial it's it's energy and what happens is we as human beings in these physical bodies with our emotions and stories we block ourselves and so what the practice of kundalini yoga does is yoga is, is is a technology that we use it's a form that we use in order to access the kundalini within us you know some people um like to see kundalini as like you could see it as prana life force chi you know some ways i like to describe it i know you like randy it's it's like the artist muse you know it's when all of a sudden that creativity just clicks and you're just in that flow that's kundalini and then um just to kind of describe where it is and what it is in in the way that the yogis described it they actually said that it lies at about the fourth vertebrae of the spine and recently randy's heard a lot a lot of this talk in my classes because i like to think of more of the scientific physiological aspects of things i don't try to be too esoteric about everything it's just probably part of my background in finance and logical brain. But um, one really interesting thing that we're discovering now is the cerebral spinal fluid. And that's, you know, that's the fluid that bathes your, your spine, your central nervous system and your brain. And one way that Kundalini yoga is described is it's the yoga of nerve strength. So when we're working in these practices, you're not just working on, you know, the muscles and the spinal alignment. You are working on those, but you're also going deeper. You're working on your nervous system, which is so important because that's your immediate response to things, you know, and these days our nervous systems are totally shot because we're just going, 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 going all the time. So part of having a strong nervous system is also knowing when to rest when to just let your body, your brain, like assimilate everything, you know, like really take it all in. And then you could be more articulate and clear about that. So going back to the cerebral spinal fluid, that's that fluid that bathes your central nervous system, bathes your brain, it cleanses, clears. It's supposedly renewed about two to three times a day. We carry about as much as what's in a water bottle. And they think, and they're still sort of figuring some of this out, that it's, it's cleansed up here in the brain, right? So going along with this idea, this fluid is said to be the vehicle for Kundalini. This is what this uh, doctor from Harvard is now theorizing. He's out in California. I've been having some conversations with him about this and it's fascinating. So if, if Kundalini is at the fourth vertebrae, right, of the spine, lower lumbar, the central nervous system comes down to about L2. So you've got central nervous system tendrils, and then you've got like L4 down here where Kundalini supposedly is. And then you've got this fluid. So if we're stagnant all the time, if we're sitting or lying down or not moving that area of the body, it becomes really swamp-like. It becomes really just, you know, not fun, right? And then that energy is not flowing up to be cleansed and renewed in the brain. So a lot of what we're doing in Kundalini yoga, we actually focus a lot on the low spine. Initially, we'll do things like I've actually got this really cool rocking chair that I sit on, I'll have to show you guys it. But you can sit here and rock, we, what we do is we rock the low spine. So it starts to move like a wave, that cerebral spinal fluid at the base of the spine. So we start to move that energy from L4 to L2, and then it begins to communicate through the central nervous system, moving all the way up into this area in the brain, the yogis called the cave of Brahman, Brahman being like the sage, you know, the wisdom 
and it's actually the third ventricle of the brain. And that's where all that fluid is held and then renewed and cleansed. That's also where our pineal gland is and where our pituitary gland is. It's like a little area between those two. And those are our master glands of the body. You know, they're controlling so much. And so when we're doing Kundalini, we're, we're moving that energy like a wave in the body. We're renewing it, we're cleansing it. And when that, I say energy, we can also just say fluid, when it's clear, I theorize that that's when we think more clearly, right? You know, we don't want to be thinking and sitting in swampy water, you know? Yuck, right? <laughs> we want to be really clear. And I feel like, you know, a lot of students, um, my, my partner actually is an artist as well. In his first class with me, he was just like, whoa. And he went home and wrote a song like immediately. And um, I feel like that's how and why that happens because you have more clarity, literally clarity of the brain. You're cleansing, you know, this whole brain system up here. You're calming your central nervous system down. So you're not in fight or flight, which is the back part of the brain that'll sort of hijack you. Is that enough? <laughs> no, right. You know, you speak to so many things that I've been experiencing and I haven't really been able to kind of like get into this with you, but I have lots of sort of practices in my life. I'm kind of a very scheduled, you know, uh, you planner. Yeah. Except for when it comes to my, my creative work, um, as a writer, it's sort of bits and pieces here and a little bit of this and a little bit of that for the longest time. And if I have a project that's due, that's the project that I focus on and kind of can't keep, keep everything going at the same time. And it's, and it's usually very stressful. It's usually not much fun. It's like, how do I have any fun like keeping all of this alive at the same time? What has really happened, and there's sort of two parts here. And one is that there is this sort of esoteric mystical piece of it that I don't understand at all. And I, I, I kind of am like enjoying that part of the, of the process right now is that I just don't know like what's <laughs> happening. And it's, it's a whole, I feel like all this light has like suddenly come, come into my, my creative process. But the other is that, like I said, I can focus all of those ideas and I can keep them all going at once. And a lot of that has to do with how intentional the practice is and what you bring to it throughout every class and every class is very different. Um, but what you bring to it is keeping me aware that the more intentional the practice is, how that applies to my life in, you know, whether it's like going shopping for groceries or sitting down to work. And, you know, you think you have this idea, but that idea changes and we, we sort of have to change directions in life. That's one thing that I remember you said once we were sort of doing one thing this way and then we're going to reverse it and do it this way. And I'm like, oh, wow. I never thought of like those subtleties mm -hmm. in life, but we do that constantly. Those like then, subtle little paradigm shifts that just, you know, we, we have to adjust to constantly. Yeah. You know, and like going from like doing your like finances to doing your creative work, you're shifting brains, you're shifting directions. And we, we have to do it constantly in modern life. So we have to practice it. That's what our yoga practice is. Yeah. And instead of that, that shift and that switch being arbitrary, it's now intentional. Mm -hmm. You know, you can clearly go from one to the next and use, you know, use this physical experience, um, the, this life force experience towards your work and your creative process. Because certainly like, you don't know where like creative sparks are going to come from, where ideas are going to come from. Like, oh my God, I'm gathering too many ideas all at once. <laughs> like, shh, 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 shh. You know, I used to be really obsessive about like writing down my ideas so that I wouldn't forget it. But now I'm like, I can lose a whole document now. And I'm like, it's still there. Like it's all still in you because it's just part of that process. And I think this is what Kundalini specifically has really turned that on for me in such a big, powerful, positive way. I'm wondering, I have experienced lots of new ideas and there's, and what I'm, I would call it confidence um, that I trust my ideas more and I, I really attribute it to the practice. There's something that just has me in a flow now creatively that I really, I, I give all credit to the practice and just kind of 
pursuing that goal as we've been working. What do you what do you think that's about? Like ideas and creative sparks. Is there some relation there? Yeah, I totally think that, that is the nervous system. I think it's a lot of the NAVA work that we do as well. So again, like Kundalini, we sort of start from the base and move up. Some people, actually Gwyneth Paltrow has gotten into it and she describes uh, Kundalini as spinal yoga, but you know, the spine is the conduit for the central nervous system. So if you've ever had a spinal misalignment, we know, all know, like if you've had one, just how painful that is because it's pinching on nerves and nerve pain is not fun. So if you have that spinal alignment and then you're working with that, like, you know, fluid movement and then strengthening your nervous system that's where I believe the strength comes from you know the yogis I'm sure everyone well I'm, I'm assuming that shouldn't do that but the chakras have become a little bit more popular these days I think I I see like chakra t-shirts and candles at Target these days so yeah. there's a little bit yeah. more of that like conversation around chakras well what chakras are is they're they're wheels they're vortexes that are energy centers in the body and my personal belief is that they are they were what the like they were called rishis these saints and sages in in india it was actually very common practice where at like towards the end of life when they no longer needed like a job or family they would go off and have these like really profound journeys in the jungle and go into these really like aesthetic practices and what would come out of them they they would write about their their experiences in a very artistic way like it was very poetic. So a lot of what comes to us about yoga is actually these like poems, these stories, these like these ways of creatively telling people what their experience was. So my personal view on the chakras is it was it was a poetic way of explaining where and how energy moves in the body. So they there's seven major ones, but there are multiple, multiple chakras all over because really all they are is intersections, right? So you just think about intersections like in your city, you you know, here in Midtown in Memphis, like Union Avenue is a major like thoroughfare, right? And then you have streets that go across it. Like we'll just focus on Cooper and Union, right? If there's a block there, then traffic is backed up. You're moving around, like nothing really flows very well. Well, your spine is like Union Avenue, right? It's that main conduit. And then you have these different energy centers that cross and those create the chakras, the vortexes. So first chakra is like base of the spine, that's your roots. And that's like your foundational, you know, just you, early childhood, like your stability, your, your, um, your ability to feel supported, right? Your family, your roots. And then you move up into sacral chakra and that's like sex organs. That's also Frankie the dog next door, by the way. Sorry. About that. <laughs> <laughs> He's a little yappy. Um, he looks like the Monopoly dog if you just need that like visual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyways, um, so sacral chakra is like creativity, right? Procreativity. It's, you know, how we bring life into earth, you know, as humans. But what the yogi saw is we can channel that energy. And what we do in yoga, specifically Kundalini, is we reverse the energies, right? So root energy mostly flows downwards. You think of a lemonade of organs, your roots like releasing, emptying, and also how roots grow into the earth, right? But what we do is we reverse. We actually pull that energy up. We have what's called root lock and we use it all the time in Kundalini. You're like squeezing and lifting the pelvic floor muscles. You're literally reversing everything to move that energy up. And think about what root energy is, you know, all these beautiful flowers and things that are popping up here in the spring, they draw upon the roots and they pull that energy up. Same with that creative sexual energy, that potency, you pull it inwards and you move it up. So you're pulling, you're, you're taking your own creative life force energy and potency and you're amplifying it. That's one of the words I love to use in Kundalini. We like amplify everything. It's like, you don't just take a sip of breath in and then exhale out. We take a sip in and we hold and we squeeze and we pull that energy up. It's like, I think of it as like a fine kombucha brew, right? I don't know if you guys drink kombucha, I'm addicted to it, but it's like, you know, it becomes that potency and it becomes actually really healthy and good for you by brewing and like stewing. And that's what we're doing in this practice. Well, then the, the next chakra, the navel, there's actually a, a nerve plexus here at the navel. Plexus means origin. And that nerve plexus, it's just a little bit below the navel area, is 72,000 nerves that extend out into the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. You think of like the Vesuvian man, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, we work specifically on that particular nerve center almost in every Kundalini practice. And the yogis related this chakra 
to confidence. So as you start to build the, that like navel center, which I firm, I believe this is why like modern day, we're so like obsessed with six pack abs, right? Or 12 pack, whatever, you know, it's like this obsession with the abs because I think it represents like courage and confidence and willpower and strength, you know, but like learning to use it for good. And that's what we do as yogis. Again, it's like learning how to channel that energy to really draw from within. Like there's a term called pratyahara that we use, which means to take everything inwards and fill up. Like you don't need all this external, you know, there's so much external. Can you learn to like go within and tap into your own like creative life force and potency, courage and willpower, you know, stability and roots. And then we pull that up into the heart chakra. You know, this, this area of the heart and the lungs, they're, they're empty vessels that are constantly working for us, constantly. So we want to we want to support them to keep circulating. The arms are an extension of that. So this area represents like constantly circulating, remaining open. What are we like when we're not open and circulating? We're doing a lot of this. We're doing a lot of this. You know, there's a lot of teenagers that sit like this. <laughs> you know, it's like not really being very open and circulating. So in our practices and we work more with opening, that's what that's representing, opening up this intersection so that we continue to circulate that energy from below. So I think of these as like the limbs, you know, of, of the plant. And then what that does is take everything up. You know, you have to go through this throat center, which there's a lot happening here. You have your thyroid, parathyroid, you know, hormonally, this is like your, your inner thermostat controlling like your mood, your metabolism, hot, cold, all of that. So you have to draw that energy up through that area, regulate it, and then take it all the way up into this head, this beautiful head of ours. This is like the flowers and the fruits, right? Bringing all those ideas to fruition. And sometimes I use the analogy of flower or fruit, but really my favorite analogy is to imagine yourself like an apple tree, right? One of those ancient, or maybe even an olive tree, right? Really ancient old tree that just continues to produce that fruit, multiple fruits. And it doesn't, it doesn't need to know where the apple and the seeds go. It just continually produces. It just gives and gives and gives. And that's, that's kind of my version of the chakra system in my artistic way. And just knowing that you always have the ability to tap into, you know, your source and pull that energy up. And that in its essence is Kundalini. That's what we're doing. We're trying to circulate and like create that cycle there infinitely. Um, can I talk to you about your creative process? Like what, what inspires you? What gets you going? Like teaching is its own, its own beast. And I, I have noticed just in the short time that I've known you that, that you seem to always be on to something new, something next, like kind of as this practice evolves for you. And you seem to be learning as much as we're learning in your class. So can you talk about your own creative process and inspiration? Yeah, my students really are, you know, my inspiration. It's really interesting who who shows up and I feel like I learn from them. I'm inspired by them, you know, to find, to help find answers, to find a way to just be a lighter human being and um, to feel that process and flow through you. That's what I'm inspired by. I love to see people come to life. I'd love to have you in class, Randy. It's been so fun just to see the light bulb moments or the even the moment that's aren't, you know, a light bulb, you've had a few classes or you've gotten angry, you know, and it's, it's nice to see people just accessing emotions. Emotions are energy and motion that, that want to be expressed and metabolized. So um, <clears throat> me personally, you know, I, we haven't really spoken on like Kundalini yoga as a, a lineage, but it was brought here in 69 as a practice from this one particular man named Yogi Bhajan. He came here from India and he founded a really large, you know, group of people doing like, these practices. I never actually met him. I met many of his teachers. My personal teacher was one of his bodyguards. And when I met him, he had left the organization for his own reasons. And um, he taught me to really just be a bit of a rebel, which is, I was, was looking for that too. I was looking for someone who was a re rebel. I was not looking for somebody that was part of an organization because part of that organization was that you have to do the practices as taught. And at first it's nice because you have a structure, you know, and I needed that initially. I wanted structure where I just look and, you know, I know exactly what to do, A, B, C, D, and E. But as, 
as I began teaching, I started working with my students specifically here in Memphis, you know, I found that times are evolving, people are evolving, the South is different. And I started just slightly altering the practices a little bit. And so I actually, um, I was at a big Kundalini Yoga retreat. They have, they used to have one once a year in New Mexico with people from all over the world, like thousands of people there. And this old, old, old yogi one day, I was talking to him about my practices and teaching in Memphis. And he was like, what are you doing down there? And I was like, I don't know, Kundalini Delta Groove style. So that's where my name for my studio came from, was I just kind of just, it just flowed out of my mouth. Like we're just doing Kundalini from the Delta. It's groovy, it's funny, it's different, you know, because that's how all these practices should be. They should be very organic. They should be, you know, they should be taught to the people that are in front of you, not, you know, some exact practice that was taught in 1969 in LA. You know, it was a different time. Those were different people, a different generation. So that that's sort of the beginning of my like, just search. And as I began to search more, you know, I also study a lot of Tibetan Buddhism. I find those practices really incredible. I think that they actually are, they're like cousins to one another. They're very similar in practices, um, you know, just time and hundreds of years of, you know, teachers going different ways, just kind of took the practices in different ways. But the Tibetan Buddhist practice have a lot of um, uh, more of the emotional aspects to it where you can say okay i'm feeling really angry today like how can i address that anger how can i find an antidote to that anger in in a healthy way in in like a form of meditation so for instance like an antidote to anger is to practice being more open and understanding and that's all this heart chakra area being more open and understanding so you take that knowledge and you find a kundalini kriya that helps us feel more open and cultivating more of this like feeling of being open and understanding. And that's a big motivation of mine is like how to, how to balance our emotions. Cause we weren't taught that, you know, like we've never been taught emotional balance as you know, humans. I see this in, I have teenagers and I'm like, man, I wish, I wish I, I, I am starting to teach them more, but like, I wish that they had that as part of their programming. You know, all we do is like drill them with logic, you know, testing, you know, learn, 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 learn. But instead like go within, how can you handle these emotions that you're feeling? So that's another motivation. Um, I also find that, you know, we have so much access in modern time to so much information in science. And I'm, I'm really passionate about connecting like modern day neuroscience and psychology with these practices that the yogis had. So I, I've actually gone back to school. I'm actually back at the University of Memphis and taking psychology classes. And um, my professors are all really funny. They're like, they're getting into yoga. So I'm like the yoga expert, but they're the psychology expert. And we're having some really cool conversations. You you know, it's, um, I think we're sort of at this nexus point where, where things like that are happening. And that's a huge motivation for me. I think there was one time where you talked to, you talked to me about it. He talks to me about your class literally all the time. And he's, um, he, you came in, there was one, there was one class that, that y'all did. And he was like, that class really messed me up. I really can't get up. Like, I was like, just all this stuff was just coming up and I couldn't like, I just sat in and I couldn't deal with it, but I'm trying to deal with it and I don't know. And it's got me messed up now for days. <laughs> and I was like, um, are, are you okay? Like, is this a good thing? I'm not sure. Is this good? Is this bad? I don't know how to help you. And that that made me think of, well, when we're artists and part of the process of the show, the whole thing about the show is about process and things happen. Emotions like anger or frustration or being stuck in your work or in your the work on yourself happens all the time and I, I literally was about to be like you should just like bail bail out bail out bail out <laughs> like, but then he stuck with it and actually pushed to the other side which came up with all this great stuff that we had been that we got to work on later in our in our work together so you know Nashville sits on a rock and it's 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 like kind of hilly kind of rocky you know kind of foresty right mm -hmm. memphis is here in the delta right we're right on the mississippi river it's muddy it's clay it's you know soft soil really fertile fertile soil so in places like nashville or in places like boulder you know you it takes a while to take root there it takes a while to you have to kind of be established in order to go in and do something whereas i feel like here in memphis 
you know, I think that might be part of this interesting vortex of Memphis is you do get to play, you do get to experiment, you know, the, the, the soil's soft, you can start to take root a little bit more easily here, but do you have staying power? And I feel like that is the test of being here in the South. You know, can you sustain? Are you gonna be able to continue to produce? And, you know, do you have the long, the long staying power? Olivia, thank you so, so much. This has just been the best. Um, and I'm so happy to share you with our audience. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, I just, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing where my practice goes, if I can just speak for myself. Um, but also like be, being more aware of how this practice and other disciplines work alongside the creative process as we, as we watch our three artists over the next 12 weeks, as we watch them kind of move from start to finish on their work as well. Thank you so much. This has been so fun. Thank you for having me, Taylor. It's nice to meet you. I hope to it's see nice you. It's nice to see your face. I know. And I'm going to have to like get in the class and work on some, work on some roots, I think, for sure. Sounds like a good plan. All right. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Olivia. Make sure you all follow Delta Groove Yoga at Delta Groove Yoga right here in Memphis, Tennessee.